There's a particular detail in our gospel today that we should not pass over. And it might seem like a rather insignificant detail, except it brings out, I think, a great deal in our appreciation of what is taking place. And that detail is what Martha says to our Lord when he says, take away the stone. She says, Lord, that's not a good idea. There will be a stench. He has been, in, he has been dead for four days. For four days. We live in a society that's rather, rather sterilized of death. We don't, we don't encounter death. We embalm our dead or we cremate them. And so we try to ignore the fact that they're dead, pretend that they haven't died. But in a society like the society in which our Lord was living, in which they don't embalm the body and they don't cremate the body, they simply let the body disintegrate. Then you would know a few things very clearly. And one is that for the first three days after death, there is not much external evidence that the person is dead. We look for signs like breathing and no... There's no breathing, there's no heartbeat, the body is cold, the pallor of the skin. But there isn't a discernible sign that the Spirit has indeed left the body for the first three days. It is on the fourth day. It's on the fourth day that the body begins to corrupt. And that corruption is made known immediately by the beginning of the odor of death, of that stench which is really one of the most horrible smells, one of the most offensive to the nostrils. And so Ma Martha is not just telling our Lord, uh, don't do that, it'll be unpleasant for everybody. <laughs> she is pointing out to him and to us that Lazarus is not just mostly dead, he's completely dead. Not to say that he wasn't dead before, but, but that it's very evident that he is dead. His body has begun to corrupt. The smell is beginning to issue out, and, and there's no hope. There's no hope because as long as the body's lying there, we could say, oh, maybe he's breathing again. Oh, maybe that was a... A, a flicker of his eyelid or something. But when the body begins to corrupt, we know without a shadow of a doubt that the one we love is truly dead. If you think about the timing of how things took place, and you think about the fact that our Lord stayed where he was, he gets the word. They say to him, they send to him saying, Lazarus is ill, please come, please come, please come. And he doesn't go immediately. It's a wondrous statement that, that St. John makes when he says, because now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was ill, he remained for two days in the place where he was. We could say, how is that loving Martha and Mary and Lazarus? What do you mean, St. John? What do you mean that he loved them so he stayed where he was? Well, it's brought out in some sense, not only by the words of our Lord to his apostles, I'm glad for you that I was not there. Lazarus has died. I'm glad for you I wasn't there that you may believe. It's a deliberate intention, our Lord, not actually to set out for Bethany until Lazarus has died and not to arrive in Bethany until the fourth day after he has died. Why? Because if he had left two days earlier and arrived on the second day after Lazarus had died and raised him 
from the dead, the people might have had an excuse to say, he wasn't really dead. He didn't really die. His body didn't see any, any corruption. We don't know that he actually died. We don't have any certainty. And so it looks like Jesus just came in and rescued him in the nick of time. But when our Lord arrives on the fourth day, it's very clear he is truly dead. And being truly dead, he is wondrously raised. It means that our Lord in raising Lazarus from the dead doesn't just simply breathe breath into his lungs, doesn't simply resuscitate him like doing CPR. It means that our Lord has actually reversed the effects of corruption. And not only that, but healed him of the very infirmity which brought about his death. We don't see Lazarus coming out of the tomb, cough, cough, sick again. He is well. He's alive and he's well. And this is so astonishing that the very last words of our gospel say, now many of the Jews who had come to Mary and seen what he had done began to believe in him. They began to believe. These are people who have held out. They've held out against people being blind, who've been given their sight, people who are deaf, who've been giving their hearing again, people who are lame, who've been walking again. These are people who have held out against our Lord, commanding the evil spirits, and out they go. But they see this sign, and they believe. They believe that He's really the one who has promised, the promised Messiah, the Lord, the Son of God, they believe what Martha herself already believed when she says, I have come to believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, the one who is coming into the world. And because of this miracle, there are so many people who are being converted, who are coming to believe in the fact that Jesus is who he says he is. And what I'm simply pointing out is it's crucial that our Lord arrived on the fourth day. Lazarus is resuscitated in the sense that he's brought back to life, but he will have to die again. Lazarus did, in fact, die again. We know when he died. We know where he is buried in France. We know where Lazarus' tomb is. He has two tombs. It's incredible. The man who had a tomb where he was buried in Jerusalem, I've been there. But he's not buried there because he was raised back to life. But Lazarus did, in fact, die again. He did, in fact, have to undergo death still. And so this raising of Lazarus back to life is not yet the demonstration of the promise of what God wants to do for us it is itself still a sign, something still pointing forward to something greater than itself. And I would say there are three things, three things that this literal act of love, this literal raising of Lazarus back to life is pointing to, are pointing to three things. The first, it is pointing to the reality that Christ himself will die and be raised, and that it will be greater than the raising of Lazarus, that Christ will suffer not the corruption of the body, for he will be raised on the third day to show that his body has not undergone corruption, but he will undergo a worse travail, a worse evil than the mere sickness of the body and the corruption in the grave, he will undergo the torment of sin and of hatred. His body will be scarred and broken and bruised by our sins, by human hatred and negligence and cowardice and 
yet it will be fully restored. Even the effects of our Lord's passion, even the blows from the scourges and from the rods and from the hands and the spit, even the, all that will be healed in his resurrection. This is the first thing that our Lord is pointing to in raising Lazarus from the dead, is that he himself will, raise, will be raised from the dead by his own power, as he will say in the gospel, no one takes my life from me, I lay it down on my own accord, I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. Lazarus is raised to life by the power of another. Jesus will be raised to life by his own power. And this is being foreshadowed and pointed to by the raising of Lazarus. The second thing that our Lord is pointing to is the fact that we, when we have undergone the spiritual suffering in, of illness or death by our sins can yet be restored. That God does not desire us to come into heaven smelling like sin. That, that the whole idea, which is very current in the world around us, that we can't ever really be healed or made holy, that God simply waves his hand and says, well, I don't care anymore isn't true that in fact, when we are healed sacramentally by the graces of the sacrament of confession, our sins are forgiven and the corruption, the taint of sin is removed, is healed. It is not that we are simply left sick. It is we are made well inside. Even, even when we have fallen sorrowfully and unfortunately into grave sin, that God is capable of restoring us interiorly to life and to a life that is greater and more abundant and more full than it was before we died because it has been truly healed. And this is the second thing that Jesus is foreshadowing in giving this resurrection to Lazarus is to say to you and to me, do not fear do not be afraid. Come to me because I am the resurrection and the life. I can restore that which has been lost. I can give life to that which has fallen into the death of sin and sorrow. And the third thing that our Lord is holding out to us is a true promise. A true promise that in and through the graces that he will endure in his suffering and his death, in and through the healing of our hearts and lives through the sacrament of confession and through the sacramental graces of the church, the, the Lord will in fact raise us, not as he raised Lazarus to a mortal life, to, to just resuscitating him to mortal life, but will raise us to a glorified life, to a life that is no longer in danger of dying, to a healing that is glorious and full, that God will at the end of days raise our mortal bodies even though they have seen corruption, even though that they have seen the disintegration of the grave, that our Lord is yet capable of raising them to new life and raising them to a life with him forever in heaven. And this indeed is what the prophet foretells. This is indeed what the prophet is promising on God's behalf when he says to you and to me in these three ways, thus says the Lord God, O oh my people, I will open your graves and have you rise from them and bring you back to the land of Israel, then you shall know, as the people who saw Lazarus raised from the dead knew, the, you shall know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and have you rise from them, O oh my people, I will put my spirit in you that you may live, 
not just a natural life, but a supernatural life, a life that cannot be quenched by the power of death. And I will settle you upon the land. What land? The earthly land or the heavenly land to which we long? I will settle you upon your land that you may know that I am the Lord. I have promised and I will do it, says the Lord. 